I once had a shaman come to an observer's event, and he explained to me that only so much wisdom comes with learning through a book or a lecture. When you actually experience something for yourself, it adds a level of understanding. I've known Michael Steinbacher for a while, been familiar with his work, but I can admit to a lack of understanding when it came to the mechanics in the present forms. Beyond just knowing his general hypotheses, I knew nothing. His methods are simple. It's just going out and looking and seeing and then rereading the legends and then just challenging your own ideas and trying to get as close as you can to what actually happened using all of the things that we have at our resources. Oregon, Smith Rock. We're standing on one cliff looking at black and gray rocks down to the water that allegedly cut the formation in front of us. On the other side we have light colored and reddish rock. After learning that volcanic flows had allegedly come through here laying the rocks that the water had then removed over time, I mentioned I was skeptical that water would happen to cut right along the exact line separating the black rocks and the red rocks, the inexplicably separated rock layers within a volcanic flow. Different sides of the water, different rocks. Here's our look from above. We're at the right side looking to the left. Now let me turn on terrain and zoom out. The rock separation magically along the water cut line, partially made by volcanic flows, isn't even linear. It wraps all the way around. Since mountains are allegedly folded crust, I might also add that this is a funny way for material to fold upward. According to Michael Steinbacher, there are logical explanations for these strange aspects of geology, and they're everywhere. I guess we're going to talk about catastrophic geology. Yeah. Uh, it's a hell of a deal. A lot of people talk about it around the world, not just Hebrews. Hebrews are real detailed, they were literate. They seem to have a, the most accurate descriptions of these things. And uh, apparently it was a comet interaction, a huge comet, possibly Venus, doesn't have to be. And it caused the plagues of Egypt, the plague of darkness in particular, which is has the most impact on geology because the darkness was caused by dust, gravel, rocks, and boulders falling from the sky. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. You couldn't recognize the person next to you. Sometimes the rocks were mingled with a river of fire glowing red hot, something similar to the aurora, a plasma. Probably because of interactions of electricity between the two charged bodies. That gives you the chance to make rock in situ, just from red hot dust that a geologist would never consider. There's a flood caused by a change in rotation of Earth because of an arc discharge that possibly changed the polarity, causing a flood. The material would stick to anything that wasn't underwater with moving water, because if it falls into the water, it gets washed away. If it lands on something dry, it grows, and it seems to have grown and created mountains really quickly. Did he just say Venus? We can all picture the comet of ancient legends, but perhaps we shouldn't ignore the ancient stories of gods doing battle in the skies. What much of science now agrees took place, but which they say happened millions and millions of years ago, is precisely what our ancestors described seeing in the skies. At this point, we're talking about the exact same event described, but a time differential of millions of years. Anyway, back to geology. These mountainous forms might have been grown, not lifted, according to Steinbacher, in a process that creates these cap rocks and forms what Michael refers to as welded tuff. Rather than having water erode everything around the cap rock, which allegedly flowed there in a molten river, and then eroded everything else down the mountain, the idea is that a massive flood was present during the molten dust bombardment, and only pieces of land sticking up from the flood accumulated material, while the water removed that which fell on the flooded areas. I read about this in Worlds in Collision, but it didn't click. It didn't like, well, what would be the significance of that? Velikovsky talks about the rivers running in reverse. I then started seeing flood remnants in the desert. So I called my friend Mel and I said, Mel, I think there's a bulge at the equator. And he goes, yeah, 26 and a half miles, 13 and a quarter miles, on either side, 68,000 feet. And I like to emphasize thousand. And what is a welded tuff? Red hot dust, 
blowing downwind, sticking to an obstruction, in this case, sticking up above a flooded area where it can accumulate, it's washed away, even if it's red hot, the water would cool it off, it's dirt, it gets washed. Where it's dry, the material sticks to the windward side and grows back and up into the wind in a really simple manner. And you can just see the extent of it. It's really not until you go see the rocks that the long-held explanation for how these formations came to be seem questionable. But you have to go see it for yourself. I'd say the shaman would be proud. Electricity can organize dust movement and then throw in water and molten dust into these equations, which is hard to replicate. But yeah, it starts to give you an idea for how quickly things can happen. The material that we find in comets, all of them seem to have hydrocarbons similar to the stuff in oil shale. They have dolomite, which answers all sorts of geolog geology problems. And has everything required to explain the geologic column, coal, oil, everything. And it's just a whole different way of looking at things once you take into account electricity, comet, comets, and then eyewitness accounts. And then you try to put it together. And they talk about the fact that people had to come across the Bering Straits after there were no people here, and they find this in the fossil record. And they needed to be repopulated. This is probably the reason why. There might have been a few survivors, but not many. Where the people escaped, it would just look like there were cave people living there. But these were probably intelligent, civilized, advanced people who ran into caves and came out with none of their their toys or tools. Just like we would today if this happened again. We would become cave people with no technology after exiting our shelter. How would you introduce somebody to basalt? I guess the standard model is the way to start, and then everything has to be from a volcano. It's iron-rich, melted earth, dirt, that's turned into a rock, that has lots of iron, that always comes out of a volcano and flows downhill. And it doesn't work. It, it doesn't make any sense when you start to look at the details. The geologists should have looked at these details and questioned them. That's not part of the process. Billy Yelverton recreates geology in his lab in Georgia. Here's a look at Billy's plasma, electric, and magnetic lab where he's produced many of the geological forms seen on Earth, Mars, and the Moon, all using electricity or plasma.
It's not like you have to search this stuff out. It's everywhere. So no matter where you go, it's incredible. And it's like, wow, I must be the luckiest person in the world. Everywhere I go, I'm finding these special places. And then eventually I realize that I'm not so special. They're everywhere. It just bites you in the butt. It's not subtle. It's really stark, especially in the deserts where there's no vegetation. My first choice would be a Berkeley current, one positive, one negative, one attractive, one more electrical than the other, one attracting ions, one producing electrons that's making basalt and melting things more than others. One of these is in Sinai, where there's fire and brimstone. They also had fire serpents in Lapland. They're red, green, and blue, the same colors as the aurora. There were waves of fire that were killing people. They referred to them as fire serpents. This is in Sinai, where one of those double circles is. The other is Namibia, the big boy, Brandberg Massif, and then the thing southwest of it. And they both have dirt coming up from the southwest formation, going towards the north and kind of towards the positive. Let's say somebody wants to get out there and see these things for themselves. How available are you to actually take people out to, to these sites and, uh, and show them? Utterly. This is my life. This is all I do if people come with me. They can see it and share it and see things I don't see. You've seen things I didn't see. Everybody's different. I'm set up to view things in one particular manner. Others go out with me and go, oh, look at that. It's something I missed. And it's so exciting for both of us because they're seeing things that nobody else has seen, a unique concept. I can go visit people. They can come to me. There's all kinds of ways of doing this. And it's more fun than you can imagine. It's just the most exciting thing.